Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. Top of mind this past week, we saw NVIDIA at one point top Microsoft and Apple as the world's most valuable company, reaching a new record. It's since fallen back behind Microsoft. And now, along with Apple, the three are pretty much neck and neck when it comes to market cap. It's pretty close. Still, NVIDIA up around 800% since the beginning of 2023. And speaking of records, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ notching all-time highs this past week as more Wall Street firms piled on the bullish equity call and as Bank of America's institutional clients piled into U.S. equities for the second week in a row. More on the market and investing environment from two individuals whose firms oversee trillions of dollars in assets and client money. Plus, the Alt MBA with the CEO of Ability and the CEO of Alt Finance on helping HBCU students explore a future in the world of private equity. Also, he had a front row seat to the AIDS crisis and the pandemic. What the nation's top infectious disease doctor says about being on call and advising seven presidents through it all. We're talking about Dr. Anthony Fauci. And we reflect on the complicated journey of acceptance for the LGBTQ community with the CEO of GLAAD. All of that to come, we begin with the world of asset management. I was in Nashville earlier this month for BNY Mellon Pershing Insight 2024. It's a gathering for the wealth management industry. And at it, I moderated a keynote with two senior execs in the asset management business who see so much and who shared their outlook and views on everything from AI and alts to debt, deglobalization, demographics and geopolitics, and I'm gonna say a lot more. On Carol's panel, Jenny Johnson, president and CEO at Franklin Templeton, and Han- Monica Smits, Senior Executive Vice President and Global Head of Investment Management at BNY Mellon. The conversation began with what is top of mind when it comes to the macro environment. Everybody's talking about kind of the whether you have five or three or six D's, but I'll start with the D's. <laughs> um, look, demographics is going to be key and it's going to be developed economies have aging demographics and or um, developed economies have aging demographics and developing tend to have um, uh, younger demographics, except for China, obviously. And it's going to have an impact on investing. There's going to be opportunities, but it's also going to drag down economies as a younger, smaller workforce has to support the, the folks that are older. Uh, and then those economies that are developing with it, like India, 56% of the population of India, 1.4 trillion people, is under the age of 25. So as long as they can educate them, yeah. right, they can be participating in it. So demographics is important. Um, obviously, I'll call it disinflation so we can say our Ds, obviously, where the interest rate <laughs> environment goes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the supply chain uh, sort of reorienting supply chains is going to be, I think, uh, opportunity from an investment standpoint. It's also inflationary. There's a reason we were in China. The China plus one story, um, you were in China because it was cheap, right? So as yeah. soon as you start to decouple and, and um, you know, change your supply chain, you're going to end up uh, adding some costs to that, not to mention tariffs and others from a, a geopolitical uh, decarbonization. Right? You know, unfortunately in the U.S., it is a it's become this red and blue state uh, conversation. You know, obviously, Hanaki, you're based in London. You go to Europe; it is still a huge focus. And the reality is, over 90 percent of the world's you know governments that control 90 percent of the world's GDP have committed to net zero. Whether they get there or not is irrelevant, but they're focused on investing on that. Um, and then finally, I'll call it digitization, is just this, uh, we're living in a, a massive technological advanced age with AI, things like blockchain, yeah. uh, and those are going to drive investment results. And then I got to throw in U.S. debt. I don't think we're talking enough about uh, the longer term impact of, of, of U.S. debt. I feel like it's safe to say that all of us have spent our careers a few years ago, a few decades ago, where it came up in every market conversation. Then it went away. It is back, and I feel like with a vengeance. All right, Hanukkah, let's go to you. In terms of the global macro. Yeah, so Jenny summed up, I summed it up very well, and we're sort of seeing the same trends. I was actually quite interested to see that the audience here, so, you know, you think about the trends, actually feel optimistic about investing. Are you surprised? 
Well, yes and no. And I would say the ones that, you know, we take a step back and think about these trends. Trends create uncertainty, but trends can, those trends and uncertainty can also create opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Because when there's more volatility, uh, in, in markets and in responses, people will respond differently, have, have different needs, uh, and that can create investment opportunities. Now, having said that, in, in this world of uh, what appears to be disinflation, um, although there's some conflicting data sort of coming For out, sure. we're of course all keenly watching what the various central banks around the world are going to do. I think the ECB is coming out tomorrow, yeah. uh, the Fed next week. Uh, we have an expectation that generally we're still at rates higher for longer, but we are expecting with the information that is starting to come out, um, a tighter, uh, or sort of lower, uh, lo lo tighter employment, um, that we are expecting to see um, some cuts later in the year, but we're not going to go back as low as where, where we've come from. And I do think we're going to get back to an environment where having higher interest rates is more the norm than the environment uh, we've come out of. One thing I want to ask you, and I think, you know, we had the conversation that, hey folks, it was the low rate environment or zero rate environment that was the abnormality, Yes. right? That what we're doing right now is getting back to normal. Having said that, you have a generation of investors, advisors, who were used to this disinflationary environment. How does that, Hanukkah, let me come back to you first. You know, how do we need to kind of address that? How do we have the smart conversation around that? you know, in terms of investing and what it means. So it's two ways, right? To sort of how we deal with it in our own organizations. We do, I'm sure you have it as well, Jenny, in our own organizations, people who have only been invest, trained as investors this side of the GFC. I'm of the generation that was also investing uh, well it's good before. good to be old. Well, <laughs> it's a lot of psyche. <laughs> and actually, uh, I call it season. investment yeah. management is actually, thankfully, uh, an, a sector in which experience really matters. Yeah. And you sort of do realize that there is such a thing as cycles. But it does mean that we need to educate not only our own investors, but also our end clients in terms of what this type of environment of sort of having positive interest rates, let's call it that, uh, means for investors and what it means for asset allocation. So we're spending a lot of time um, educating our end client, our advisors, but also our own, our own workforce. Jenny, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the reality is I think we're getting into what historically is a more normal interest rate environment. And if you look at it, um, the, you know, the, the economy has actually been able to absorb the rates increases pretty well. Uh, it's pretty aggressive in the last year, right? Yeah, yeah. very aggressive. Yeah. I mean, I, I described to people as like, you know, of course you're going like to see whiplash. some slowing down data. They jammed on the brakes, right? You know, I re exactly. It's whiplash. Um, but we're also in the camp. And I, I, I caveat it with that Franklin Templeton. So um, we're 1.6 trillion, but we have we have five different uh, CIOs who have slightly different views. CIO, macroeconomic CIOs that have a slightly different views. So I'm going to, it's a little bit Is like. Is there a lot picking, of debate there? Oh, huge debate. That will, Matter of fact, that is insisted that, that, that especially the ones that are the furthest apart to make sure that they're at least having an internal debate on it. But, you know, I tend to, and, and it's obviously converged over time, um, but, you know, rates are higher for longer. Uh, the economy has definitely absorbed it pretty well. Uh, and, you know, if, we, if I were to guess, I, I think it's maybe just one rate increase this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I had to take a second guess, I'd say it could even be zero. You know, that, that it's more towards inflation being a little bit stickier and harder for the Fed to truly get um, under control uh, than probably. And I know there's some yes. weaker data coming out, but uh, it just... ISM but, services today, pretty strong. Yeah. I, I, but I think you're right, because there are also, to your earlier point, there continues to be inflationary pressure from animating from the supply chain as well, right? So right. you look at also the conflicts around the world, which is putting pressure. Certainly we've seen this being based in London on our doorstep. We've seen it in energy price. We've seen it in food prices. Mm -hmm. It's coming down a bit. We're seeing that the Middle East conflict at the moment is also putting pressure on the supply chain. You and I were talking earlier about aviation, Carol, and, mm -hmm. uh, and flights. I mean, you can't just simply fly or 
airlines can't have to reroute where they go. My flight, you know, anytime I go to Japan from London, it, we're now, the flight is taking an extra two and a half hours because we're not going over Russia. So think about yeah. the cost of time, the cost of fuel, and, you know, those costs will have to get passed on in the price of goods. So it's, it's that inflationary pressure, I think, is still there. These big, de- go ahead. No. I was just going to laugh. I was going to say, you, one of the advantages that all you have is you're from all different places in the U.S. Uh, because, you know, sometimes you get, I always say, my mother was a doctor and she said one thing that always bothered her is about doctors is sometimes they didn't just look at what was in front of them. They always had to be proven through research and sometimes it's obvious in front of you. If you talk about the environment around you, I bought a, a, a truck for the farm this weekend and I used to finance, I ran a financing company of autos, and so whenever I bought a car, I'd go into the dealership and say, show me your invoice and we'll start there and work our way up. It was, let's start at manufacturer's su- suggested retail price and we'll tell you what fees we added. And it took me three months of walking out. I finally asked somebody in California, can you see what you can get there? I was not gonna buy a car for above MSRP. And you know what? In the end, I ended up doing that. It really, it has changed so much. And so, you know, you walk into a restaurant. Are they still pretty full? You guys, you know, again, you only see where you're going. But as you ask each other around, it feels like it's still pretty robust out there. Does it feel like, and I want to bring in a question. These are great questions, so thank you. What concerns you do you have regarding the rise of nationalism and populism pushing us away from globalization and its effect on those emerging markets? Like what you folks are talking about feels like not going away anytime soon. Agreed, and that's yes. inflationary. And that's inflationary. It is. No, I agree as well. I mean, it's been a, it's been a concern of mine and of ours for some time, this rise of national, nationalism and also the benefit. So our generation has really benefited from what I would call the peace dividend, right, following yeah. sort of the Second World's War. And it was all about globalization. We all read the book, The World is Flat, that came out, 20, didn't you, Jenny? Yes, I did. I'm sure I you that. did, uh, some <laughs> 20 fun. years ago. And that, but that is changing. We're all, Jenny was talking about earlier we were all moving manufacturing to China that is no longer happening we're sort of reshoring uh, and and that is adding to cost as well so it's some mix of nationalism then a much more tense geopolitical environment as well you throw that into the mix um, and, and it is making for a much more combustible yeah. environment that I, I, I think will provide a challenge for corporates over the long term, notwithstanding what we're seeing yeah. today. That was Hanukkah Smiths and Jenny Johnson in conversation with Carol from their panel at BNY Mellon Pershing Insight earlier this month. That was in Nashville, Tennessee. Coming up, more from the conversation, including the dreaded D word, debt, ballooning U.S. federal debt, the impact and what to do. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. This past week, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office ramped up its estimate for this year's U.S. budget deficit by 27 percent to almost $2 trillion, sounding a fresh alarm about an unprecedented trajectory for federal borrowing. The CBO sees the deficit reaching $1.92 trillion in 2024 this year, up from $1.69 trillion in 2023. Longer term, U.S. national debt set to top $56 trillion by 2034 as rising spending and interest expenses outpace tax revenues. A lot of numbers throwing it at everybody. The bottom line is U.S. federal debt, it's growing. Yeah, and I think for many people, they would argue that it's becoming a crisis. On that, we continue with Jenny Johnson, president and CEO at Franklin Templeton, and Hanukkah Smits, senior executive VP and global head of investment management at BNY Mellon, who sat down with Carol at the recent BNY Mellon Pershing Insight Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. We are not at threat of not being the reserve currency. We're going to continue to be the reserve currency because there's nowhere else that anybody's going to go. The question is... You still need buyers of debt, and 70% of U.S. debt is going to come uh, in the next six years is going to turn over. Unfortunately, what we didn't do is lock in long-term U.S. Treasuries when rates were really low. And right now, that, six, that, that 70%, we're paying about 2.4% interest on it. The U.S. Budget Office predicts the next 10 years in debt, the cost of interest is 3.5%. Okay, that's 
probably 1% difference crowds out so much spending. We already this year will spend more on interest than we will on defense spending. So the question for all of you is to think about, well, where does that money come from? It has to come from corporations, mutual funds, uh, insurance companies, or it comes from the Fed, right? And the Fed quietly, they were reducing their balance sheet and ownership of treasuries, 95 billion a month. They quietly moved that down to retiring 60 billion, and now they're down to 25 billion. Right. It's because they worry about the treasury market. And so it's, it just becomes a crowding out of other investments. And so you have to ask yourself, at what price does somebody say, I'm not gonna invest here, I'm well, gonna go buy treasury? I love that you do. We had a story on Bloomberg recently and it talked about longevity and the need for government to issue more debt, will lead to higher rates, the impact will have on investors seeking out more productive ways to fund their pension liabilities and so on. So basically, you know, fewer bonds, more stocks and commodities. Like Han Hanukkah, come on in on this issue of debt and how that impacts perhaps you know, investment portfolios, retail institutional over the longer term? Well, generally, um, you, helping clients understand how to manage for retirement is, of course, a very big topic. I'm sure it's a very big topic that is right. keeping everyone here to, uh, in the coming days very, very occupied, right? The funding gap that exists both as, as an individual level and also at a state level that governments around the world can't really fund is, is well understood. It's then what we do about it, right? And how we, how we as investment managers offer better solutions to the advisors to work with their clients so they can actually have, you know, retire well with income. And with that, you have to have a portfolio that doesn't consist of debt securities, but also provides income and has an opportunity for growth as well, which gets you into a combination of equity investing and possibly alternative investing, which is, of course, the strength that's been long underway in asset management. But you need to have a more holistic view, both in terms of what you want to achieve as you move into retirement and how you're going to meet effectively your liabilities once you're in retirement. Well, it makes me bring up kind of the debate over active versus passive, right? It's been so easy, it feels like, for so long to just kind of buy the market, buy the mm -hmm. index, right? But it does feel like with some of these big, the, the Ds that you laid out, the big issues, that you're going to have to be more selective in terms of reaching those retirement goals. Is that fair? Well, active and passive is about cost and about outperformance, right? So it, when you're an active, which, which we both are, but right. we also have, at be in my Mellon, we also yeah. offer uh, indexing products. Um, so it's about how you both deliver outperformance and outperformance relative to market to clients, which is the active piece, but also how you combine it with passive so you can do it in a cost-effective manner. So I think there's room for both in client portfolios, and it's really uh, important to have both. But once you look at active, we also see that not that the majority of active managers underperform, right? Yeah. It's really important to focus on performance. We're pleased to say that on the whole, our equity-focused managers and fixed-income managers do outperform over the long term, it's and crucial, that's critical. Right? That's, I mean, but I think about we, we have a guest on, and Forgive me, but like I'll look at someone's performance. I'm like, why are we talking to this person? They've underperformed for the past five okay. years. Yes. <laughs> all right. But all of you guys are responsible for risk-adjusted returns because actually what happens to the average investor is they love to be able to get the ride up. What kills them is the downside. Yes. And if you look at, and this is where, look, mm -hmm. passive is inevitably going to outperform in lumpy markets like the Magnificent Seven uh, and momentum markets, right? Where the more you put into the same stocks, they go up. It's going to tend to outperform because a conscious risk-adjusted manager is gonna look at the Magnificent Seven in, in 2023 and say, ooh, I think I should underweight these because I'm worried. And by the way, if you did, it ended up being a really good trade. Yeah. You were underperforming, but now you're performing well because the, 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 there was a flip. And if you look at the, I think the market is healthier now than it was in 2023. Mm -hmm. It's broadening out. Their earnings are broadening out. You know, in, in 2023, it was really the Magnificent Seven that was having earning growth and everything else was actually negative earnings. Now, you've seen that come down dramatically and it's the rest and the, you know, the, the, the rest of the yeah. 493 that have had positive earnings. And then if you look at the Russell 2000, 
That earnings projects it is like up 13% this year. And in 2025, it's projected to go up to 31%. We had to check the data twice, right? That's on the on the Russell 2000 companies. I've heard more people talk about the Russell. But because you've had yeah. this underperformance in small cap, because everybody's been so focused on the big, you know, the, the and NVIDIA is probably the only one in that group that's actually predicting continued growth, big growth in earnings. Um, the other one's expansion has both, mostly been by market cap. So, you know, again, the active passive, your job is risk adjusted returns for the experience mm -hmm. of the, you know, the entire right. trip. And I, I always say it's a little bit akin to um, if you were buying a car, I don't know why I've got two car analogies <laughs> here, but you know, if, if, if somebody said to you, drive down this road at the cheapest per mile, it's flat, it's straight, and it's well paved, you'd go with a car without any safety features. But if your journey of life takes you over the mountain in a snowstorm, you're gonna wish you had those safety fe features, and that's what looking at concentration risk, you know, sector diversification, public privates, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's the, the lifetime experience of investing, and, and that's what the active advisor and the active manager has to bring to the table. One, yeah, no, I, I agree with you, but I also, it's not about just one thing, right? It's right. a combination, how you bring sure. those active and passive solutions together, together to both manage the cost, yep. as well as uh, all the factors that, that you were just setting out. It's goals, it's costs, it's a lot of things. Yeah, but it's also concentration and risk management because Clients hate nothing more than actually losing well, money. Yeah. And you they'd also, rather forgo some upsides than losing money. You said something interesting to me in the back. And um, I was talking, like knowing when to sell mm -hmm. is also an important aspect mm -hmm. yeah. of portfolio management. Yeah. Yes. And I know like everybody's like, can't market time, da da da. I get that. But there is a point where you say, good gains, maybe I lock it in. Yes. Right? Yes. And that's a part of it. It's, the hard, it's one of the harder things to do. And I think I mentioned to you, there was an interesting article in The Economist. I don't know if you saw it, Jenny, that came out this weekend, which was showing, talking about some research, how hard it is for active managers to sell. So yeah. as, a, as a sort of sector, we're very good in making the case to buy. We're not always as disciplined when it comes to making the case to sell. And I think you should all, our view is you should always look at a moment in time and determine whether continuing to own a security will still generate upside from that moment in time rather than look at the cumulative return or bank it comes perhaps a little bit from my own background in private markets where yeah. you really tend to only have very rare opportunities to sell and generally the experience once you're better off selling selling early than uh, holding on. Selling late, too late. Question, uh, have we hit a point of mania in the market, getting close, seeing all the optimistic outlooks in the room? You know, if you look at the PE ratio of the non-MAG7, it's still higher than average, right? So that would indicate that the market's pretty fully priced, except that you have earnings revision. I mean, earnings projections have been pretty good, and earnings revisions up is actually higher than average. Yeah. Uh, you see, see things like productivity gains. So all-time yeah, highs on the markets, chasing all-time highs with the credit. Well, the that's market. where, again, like, I'd probably underweight the, what has traditionally been the big winners and look at these other sectors, and that's why you, you hear like small cap, mid cap, yeah. um, you, you know, kind of that technology that's not those big mag seven type. Um, so I think there's opportunities that are still there. And then I think when you go think about international, uh, it's markets that are benefiting from this deglobalization of the, you know, uh, decoupling the supply mm -hmm. chain. Um, so there's definitely, it's, it's about where you choose. And honestly, you know, like things like China, I actually think you're starting to see some green shoots in China. Finally. Yeah, finally. And, yeah, and you know, they're pretty focused uh, on when they want to do something, yeah. you know, to be able to do it. And so, you know, there could, there could be even be opportunities open up there. And if you look at India, which has had a huge run, and what a surprise with the recent election. election. Um, so, you know, again, I think it's going to be choppy and it's about where you choose. Market mania, what are you thinking? I think Jenny just explained it well. It's, it, it is always going to, there is mania in certain sectors, but it's not, it's not everywhere. It's been very much underpinned by the Magnificent Seven uh, the, that we're very well aware of. So we focus very much away from that, but it's been hard. We've seen it in our portfolios because yeah. 
those seven, when you look at 23, have really driven the upside, and that is what investors on the whole have been chasing. But I think, it, it, I think I'm with Jenny, I think it's gonna turn. To me, some of it brought me back to the 90s. I used to come to New York, and I always thought, you know, the, the symptom of market mania was sitting in those days, not in an Uber, with a yellow cab, cab, and a cab driver asking me about internet. Oh, you're an investor, what about right. internet stocks, right? And you think, oh my, we're, we really are in a bubble, but we thought that for a long time. And I was part of an organization at the time which was focused on value. It's very, very hard, it's so not dissimilar when your clients are chasing growth. So you have to keep looking at underlying fundamentals. That was Hanukkah Smiths and Jenny Johnson in conversation with Carol from their panel at a BNY Mellon Pershing Insight Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. Still ahead, more of the conversation as we tackle the future of asset management, everything from tokenization to artificial intelligence, and how investment advisors are adjusting to all of these disruptions. More on Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Goodbye, 6040 portfolio. Hello, sneakers and rare cars. The new rich are trading long-standing investing tactics for more crypto-heavy portfolios and a passion for collectibles. Roughly 94% of Gen Z and millennial investors are interested in collecting items such as watches, rare cars, and sneakers. That's according to a new survey of wealthy Americans by Bank of America. As we wrap Carol's conversation at the BNY Mellon Pershing Insights Summit with Jenny Johnson, president and CEO at Franklin Templeton, and Hanukkah Smits, senior executive vice president and global head of investment management at BNY Mellon, we hear more on how things are changing and what investors are demanding. Talk a little bit more about what investors are really interested in today. We talk about a portfolio has a lot of moving parts, credit, growth, value, income, all the assets. Jenny, right? There's lots of pieces to this. Why don't we talk about the maybe secular trends that I think are happening that are then informing sort of what your investments, I mean, in the end, we as an industry talk about our benchmarks and this and that. Clients are like, do I have enough money to retire? Can I help my kids pay for their college, right? I mean, that, yeah. they have very specific goals, right? Yeah. But you look at the big secular trends, one is private credit is here to stay. Banks are just because of the capital requirements that have been imposed on banks, they're not lending like they used to lend and the private market has stepped in. And I don't have the same worry of this concept of shadow banking that you often hear about that because it, it's not like it's such a massive bigger number, it's just it's moved from banks balance sheets into really funds that are, you know, the investor knows they're illiquid, so you don't have to worry about a run on it. Um, so private credit's here to stay. Private equity, I mean, the, the fact is companies are just not going public as quickly. If you can remain as a private company and monetize, you know, holdings for your employees and things, right. which is what's been able to happen, you see it in the data. They're just, there's half the number of public companies and six times the number of we private equity. We talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. They're like, not why would I go private. public? Why do yeah. I have to go do my earnings report every quarter when I need to invest yep. in technology that may not pay off for three to five years, I'd rather be private to be able to do that. So I think those are the big trends. And now it's about managers figuring out how do they deliver that in a full portfolio, understanding the various characteristics of these kind of new segments and bring together a full portfolio. To yeah, be, because, to be, sorry if yeah, I can no, jump please. in here, because now you're really looking at the trade-offs between risk on risk management and liquidity, right? That is yeah. the biggest. I've been on both sides, public and private, and we, we oversee, like Jenny does, but in today's world as well, both public and private investments. And by the way, it's not just that fewer companies are going public, there's also been the delisting trend. So generally, there's fewer public securities available today while the market caps are larger. So in a portfolio sense, you can still achieve your goals. The opportunities available to public investors are fewer. That, that's just a fact. So you have to increase your exposure to the, to the real economy outside of 
public markets as well. It's really how you do it. And this is where the liquidity or access to liquidity comes in. It's a different liquidity it's a very versus different kind process. of your, your plain vanilla It's investing. an organized market. Yeah. It's, not a, it's obviously not a liquid market. So you can create liquidity, but that not, might not always be the right thing when there's a crisis because you end up being a forced seller and you may not achieve the right result for your client. So for us in our roles, it's all about making sure our end clients understand this, that we work with the advisors uh, and all of you in the audience here to educate you so you can optimally allocate to the underlying asset classes. And the exciting part is they are available to yeah. the end clients, which wasn't really the case 10, 15 years ago if we'd been set here. Just to add to what Hark has said, you know, I think that the next phase of this private markets, right now you kind of get it delivered in model portfolios with allocations and sleeves. There are vehicles, um, you know, the 40 Act Mutual Fund, for example, allows up to 15% illiquids because the sleeves still require somebody to be a qualified investor. Our Franklin Growth Equity team has been investing in late stage venture in their mutual funds because they basically were running the numbers like, we don't get the old IPO allocations that we used to get. Yeah. And so they started to do, because they're based in Silicon Valley, started to do these investments there. I think you're gonna see more of that trend and I think you're gonna start to um, potentially see people use the, what is it, the 33 Act or something where it was commodities. It's what, okay. it's what the original grayscale Bitcoin was in, but you have more flexibility. I think you're going to start to see those types of vehicles where you're going to see a combination. So it's a one ticket, but it has a combination of illiquid and liquid. That well, that's what I best. want to ask you, the democratization of assets. You think in terms of private credit, alt assets, we need to increase the access for investors. 100%. I actually think that you, you potentially, I know, I know my teams internally probably don't love this, but I think potentially you're going to start to see fixed income teams, the research for traditional fixed income and private credit to probably be combined. I don't know that it's that different Interesting. at the it's research not that level. Different. And that's the same for equities too, right? Traditional, we're all students of companies ultimately. So you can, you can own a company through a listed security in fixed or, or, or in the equity markets or through the private route. But how do we deliver that to the clients is what Jenny is talking about, is different. But I think what you really want to get to in terms of the democratization of assets, this is also a technology story because this is also about tokenization, yeah. right? Which is going to be really helpful in delivering that. So talk to us about in terms of changes to the asset management business and what you guys are doing to help advisors play with those changes. Yeah, so a big change that we started to talk about is general technology, right? Yeah. And, and AI. And that's also been a trend that's been long on the way, but it but it's been I think turbocharged to some extent in the pandemic as well, because we all really had to think how we were engaging with clients and invest much more in technology and digital uh, digital delivery. So, so how we deliver our advice is much more powered by technology. The product wrappers have changed. I know your was it your grandfather who was at the start of the mutual fund industry. Unfortunately, mutual funds are no longer the, uh, and that's an industry trend. Uh, which, which shocks me. My first job in business news was a mutual fund show, <laughs> and I, teaching investors about mutual funds. I'm not that old, but I am amazed at the rapidity, the rapid cycles yes. that. We but it's now ETFs and SMAs and RMAs, and you know our colleagues in Pershing are the are the second largest managed account provider, and we're we're bring, so one of the things we're doing, and um, even was talking about this earlier, and I think you might have heard Stephanie talk about it as well, is yeah. working with Pershing and on what we call being more for our clients by bringing together the technology that exists on the both platform, simplifying the life of the advisors, it is technology enabled, but also bringing in investment management capabilities and doing that in a very cost-effective manner. And the more that all of you um, end up doing for your clients with us, actually the more cost-efficient uh, it is going to be to the order of sort of a 40% discount. And I think that's very, very meaningful, but a lot of that is really powered by 
technology and it's simplifying the advisor's life and what it means is that the new advisors can actually spend more time with your end clients, which we know is really important. Which begs a question that came up on the call uh, with one of you guys. Um, the next generation, next gen advisor, is it even human? You know, money and is emotional to people and you probably have a lot of clients that are actually capable of managing their own money. But the more money you get, the more you realize it is, uh, it's not a part-time job, number one. Uh, and number two, the, the individual in the end wants assurances and there's an emotional component of it. So in 1997, the cover of Business Week said the internet was going to be the death of the broker. And everybody's been calling the death of the That's broker. That's before it was Bloomberg <laughs> Business Week. Anyway, go <laughs> ahead. Go. Um, you know, I just, I don't see it. I don't think, you know, and I always say quant investing works until it doesn't. You know, yeah. historical data of the last 10 years works until the Fed changes their mind and, and does something different. And then it affects it. And so you need, it's that hybrid. It, be, it becomes a tool, uh, and in the end, the I think the client wants to be serviced. The, the what the advisor is doing today is a lot more than they had to do in the past. They used to be just investment advisors. Now you're all really life planners for people. Uh, you they probably have some clients that ask you to educate their next generation and engage with the next generation. You do a financial plan, so all those things still require that kind of human touch. Is that the smart conversation around AI? I mean, AI creeps Correct. into every conversation. Not new, generative AI, LLMs, uh, machine learning, it mm -hmm. does take things to a different level. I mean, what is the smart kind of thought that these folks, investment to us, it's about sub, to us, it is about how you use it. It yeah. is very, very smart. We're, we're, we are using it and testing it in BNY Mellon as well. I have my co-pilot, uh, but I also see with that that I need to train my co-pilot for it to actually improve. It's still about pattern recognition. You actually spent time with your head of AI, right, to really yeah. understand this. Yeah, no, I was, uh, um, so I ran the technology group for a while, so I have a decent background in technology. So I wanted to learn more about AI. Uh, and after I'd spent about an hour every two weeks going through it, and I finally got to the point, I was like, okay, I got the machine learning, it's kind of regression analysis, I can understand a little bit um, on large language models and how you group these words, this and that. And then we finally got into, a certain level and I said, I have reached the maximum capacity of my brain. I think that I am not smart enough to go to the next level. But what I will say is if you look in history on technological advances, the first thing that is done is that you optimize what you do today. That's the stage we're in. We're all figuring out, you know, mm -hmm. this bot can do this. It's that next, and, and by the way, most of the investment returns in AI have been around the picks and shovels, the NVIDIAs, the Microsofts, the Amazons, those who are surrounding to be supportive of the tool. What's gonna happen is the companies in various sectors who really figure out how to leverage AI as a competitive advantage in their right. business it are gonna be the winners and others are gonna fall off because they're not gonna keep up. But the problem is just, we're like at that stage where you got your iPhone and you said, oh, it's pretty cool. I've got you know, a flashlight and a phone and music uh, and a camera. But what you, you, we didn't all appreciate is that my, uh, Apple was unlocking the creativity of the people, right? But it took time for people to understand how to use it. To, you didn't even know all the apps that you needed, to, that you need today, that you actually needed when it first came out. That's where we are with AI. We don't yet know when you start to combine models because a large language model takes a whole different programming team than uh, an AI that's looking at images or an AI that's doing um, uh, quantitative. You know, the, the ChatGPT is great at language, it's terrible at math. Right. That's tough technology problem to solve. Our thanks to Jenny Johnson, president and CEO at Franklin Templeton, and Hanukkah Smits, Senior Executive VP and Global Head of Investment Management at BNY Mellon. That from Carol's panel at the BNY Mellon Pershing Insight earlier this month in Nashville. Catch the full chat at bnymellon.com. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community with the president and CEO of GLAAD and how this year's Pride Month festivities come at a complicated time. Plus, the doctor who's been on call through some of the U.S.'s toughest health crises and on call for seven presidents. 
Dr. Anthony Fauci will be with us. First up this hour, we like to talk about alternatives here at Bloomberg. And as Bloomberg Businessweek contributor Rob Mandelbaum recently wrote in a story for Bloomberg Businessweek, the development of alternative and online MBA programs is in vogue today as traditional business schools simultaneously grow more expensive and less popular. One company offering such a program is the corporate training firm Ability, which has a comprehensive business skills course that's stylized as a 12-week MBA. The program is built around simulations of real-life business and management decision-making. For more on this alternative MBA, we're joined by Bloomberg News Senior Editor Dimitra Kessinides and the CEO of Ability, Bjorn Bilhart. The truth is there are in the U.S. right now 150,000 new MBAs every year and over a million new management positions. Mm -hmm. So close to 90 percent of new managers never set foot in a MBA in the hallowed halls of Harvard or other MBA schools. And so there's this huge gap of people that have an undergraduate degree in history and biology but are moving into corporate jobs and need to understand what an income statement, what a balance sheet looks like as they become a leader of people. They need to understand how to manage others. They need to understand how to collaborate in cross-functional projects. And so there's this need uh, where 90% of the people moving into these leadership roles don't have the time, don't have the energy to get a two-year MBA. Or the money, perhaps. Or the money, exactly. Dimitri, I want to bring you into it. When this came across your desk, when you're talking to Rob, what is it that you wanted to know about in kind of what is going on. And what do you want to ask our guests? Yeah, I mean, the first question was, are you, are, what are you intending to do? Because you're calling it the 12-week MBA. Um, but beyond that, it was really to get a better sense of what can you reasonably teach in that period of time? And how can you do it? Um, they're doing it you know, um, largely online. Uh, you know, wh- what are we going to see in the way of these programs? Because I think there is, it's not just the number of positions that Bjorn mentions, there's the interest and the desire to, uh, to move into those positions because of the potential that they offer for earnings and more. And yet, business schools are incredibly expensive. Right. So, you know, what what can you actually train for in the way that you're training? And is that really going to make a difference when they land in that job? Is it actually going to serve them? Great question. And the truth is, in 12 weeks, it's also not just 12 weeks. It's part it's part time and it's virtual. So it is a very short certificate program. It's not a full MBA, of course. It's a, it, it it is not meant to be. The truth is, though, that most people don't need all of the things that you learn in a two-year program in business. This is not like law school or medical school where you don't want a lawyer, you don't want a doctor operating on you uh, without a full degree. Um, It is very clear that there are a lot of business leaders that are extremely successful without ever having had an MBA. So unlike those other professional certificates, there isn't necessarily the need to learn two years worth of study. And so for many people who don't have the luxury of going back to an MBA, there's an alternative. To build on what Demetrius said, though, are these the people that aren't going to be CEO, but are going to be other type of managers? Like, who is this for? It's for anyone that is moving into leadership roles in companies or is planning to move into leadership roles over the next you know, five, ten years. So is it like an executive you know, program? It's like that, but it's not for executives, right? So the executive MBAs are very expensive. They're $20,000, $30,000 sometimes. This program is $2,000. So it's, a, it's huh. the price of a conference that someone can go to. So it's meant for people that are not at the executive level, level, at the executive level yeah. yet, but um, that are thinking about maybe becoming a team manager or are, are starting to manage others, starting to get into leadership roles where understanding an income statement balance sheet is becoming more important. Right. I do want to know about the content of the courses, because one thing that I found so interesting about Rob's piece, Bjorn, is the gamification here and the idea that you're sort of competing with other folks and AI is kind of the backdrop here. Um, explain what the coursework is, because it's, it's not necessarily what you'd find in a, a quote unquote traditional business school. Yeah, and I think that's the other disruption that I think is happening now. Uh, so in the in the twelve week MBA, there are no lectures, there are no powerpoints, uh, there is no e learning. Uh, in those twelve weeks, you're actually in a simulated environment where you become CEO of a company. You have to compete with others in virtual teams, and it's yeah. super fun, super engaging and allows you to see business from different vantage points. Vantage point CEO, vantage point of uh, VP of sales operations, um, and learn by doing, learn by making mistakes, and then having a facilitator who comes in and points out 
what mistakes were made as the teams competed with each other. A facilitator being another person, or is this like a, an, another part of AI? N no, there's actually real, th these, actually these are not person. AI facilitators, it's actually okay. real facilitators. So we, we actually have a lot of business school professors as well as retired executives that teach in the oh, curriculum. Smart. And But everything is all entirely online and remote. I mean, are they missing something by not having that sort of in-person human element? I mean, even schools today that have had very successful online programs they're trying to find a way to incorporate something where the people are coming together. You know, it's a fantastic question. And we actually started the 12-week MBA as an in-person program. And then when the pandemic hit, we uh, didn't have a choice wow. of moving online. But what's really interesting and fascinating, this fall, we're actually moving part of it back into the classroom. So we're going to have a capstone experience um, that people can fly into. We're based in Austin, Texas, so it's going to be in Austin, um, at least the first one. Uh, but we're going to actually slightly modify modify the curriculum from an all online curriculum to have at least one weekend where people get together and have that in-person experience. And that was based on, was it feedback? I mean, again, a feeling that there's something that they're missing out on when they're not in person. Yeah. And there's an aspect of this education that really does need to, you need to connect with people. Yeah, I think so much of education is social. It's the difference between Great. knowledge transfer and education is actually that social environment. And there's some of it that you can recreate online. And I think we've done a pretty good job creating some some yeah. of these virtual simulations and competitions, but there's something that is so important uh, about this human element when you're in person, when you're at the bar after the, after the competition and you can debrief with your peer. And so we want to bring that back. Our thanks to Bjorn Bilhart, CEO of Ability, and Dimitra Kessinides, Bloomberg News Senior Editor. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. From an alternative MBA program to Alt Finance, the nonprofit which is also helping to train the next generation of professional financial investors by working with students at historically black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs. Marcus Shaw is president and CEO at Alt Finance, which has a 10-year, $90 million commitment to reduce the underrepresentation of people of color in the world of private equity. So Alt Finance is a nonprofit um, that was seeded by Aries Oak Tree and Apollo really to address what we believe are unfortunate underrepresentation in the alternative investment industry. That's private equity, private credit, real estate, infrastructure, um, all of your non-traditional investment asset classes. And so those three companies decided that in the wake of George Floyd and a lot of the racial conversations that were happening back in 2021, that they wanted to actually commit to solving the problem by developing a broader pool of talent from historically black colleges and universities. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the, the history here because we spent a lot of time on our program and here at Bloomberg News as well, going through the promises that companies made in the wake of uh, the 2020 protests after the murder of George Floyd, and also the pushback, especially in recent months to these DEI efforts as well, which have been well documented uh, according to changes in company filings as well. I'm wondering if you're still seeing the same support from these companies that you were seeing four years ago? So absolutely. We're continuing to see that support, not only in terms of dollars, but, but in support in terms of commitment from the professionals that work there. And from my perspective, this is really about talent. Mm -hmm. No matter what business you're in, whether you're in the news business, you're in tennis, you're an athlete, Love it. no matter what yeah. you are, what you want to see is the best talent. And so if we can do that in sports, which is the ultimate meritocracy, why shouldn't we do it in other arenas? And do they stay in the industry? Do you have like, so, you know, some, do, can you share with us like how their careers progress and like, you know, what's like the, uh, I guess, attrition, so yeah. to speak, yeah. So, you know, we have early signals. Uh, we graduated our first class last year. We had 14 seniors that graduated. All of those seniors are still working in and around the industry. They're finding early success at their firms. I think one thing that we all know is the first year of being an analyst in financial services is very, very tough. Right um, you know, I think it's yeah. equivalent to being a resident in medical school or maybe, you know, your first week at boot camp in, in the armed forces. Um, it's, it's tough, um, whether no matter what your background is. So I think what we're seeing is success because students feel more comfortable. They've built relationships. They have understanding of what the workplace looks like. And so we've been able to galvanize some of the risk. Um, that students normally would experience by building this incredible network around them. 
Okay, speaking of backgrounds, a little more about you. Um, you spent 20 years in nonprofit, in finance. Um, you were at Hyde Analytics, Piedmont Investor Advisors, Bank of America Securities. I wanna know why alternatives? Of all parts of the finance ecosystem, all parts of Wall Street, why is private equity and alternative investments the place you wanted to focus on for yeah. alt finance? It's, it's a great question. And I think as with other things, the evolution of an industry breeds interest and breeds innovation. Um, when I came out of business school, sales and trading, cash sales and trading mm -hmm. and equities was incredibly important. I mean, you saw people wanting coming out of business school that wanted to be a trader on a cash equities desk. You saw people that were in traditional fixed income roles. You fast forward 20 or 25 years to where we are now, the most interesting, the most erudite people on earth are working in alternatives. Mm. They're working in private equity, they're working in private credit. Private credit is an industry, a subsector of alternatives that we've seen incredible growth in just three years. From the beginning of this organization to where we are now, we have students that are going into private equity, direct lending, private market deals in the credit yeah. space that didn't know about it when they started college. You know, talk about as well how much this even just affects, you know, more like not in the alternative space, but just, you know, regular Wall Street banks and like what, if anything, if you have a relationship with increasing diversity at um, mainstream, more mainstream financial firms. It's all part of the ecosystem. And traditionally in alternatives, folks would go through analyst programs at a traditional bulge bracket bank. They go through associate recruiting and they would then find their way into a private equity firm or a private credit real estate or infrastructure. What we're seeing now, and some of this is just the supply and demand dynamic, some of this is the growth of the industry, that many alternative investment firms are starting their own analyst programs hmm. because they need talent earlier. Or again, this is not strictly about diversity. This is about talent. It's, you know, I use the analogy of sports a lot because there are wins and losses in sports. It's ones and zeros. It's fairly binary. If we look at success in the business world the same way, we'll recognize that bringing talent from all corners of the earth, from all experiences, will increase our outcomes. And so for banks, I think they had started to see this early on, but I, as their clients, right, some of these alternative investment shops are doubling down on that, I think banks are encouraged to do the same. Marcus, I want to talk about your background and then how it plays into what you're doing at Alt Finance. Yeah. You have a uh, dual degree from Georgia Tech, but also an HBCU more, uh, Morehouse. Yes. In electrical engineering. Yep. And mathematics. Mathematics. And then you went off and got an MBA over at Duke. Yep. Talk a little bit about HBCUs and why you're focused on HBCUs as the pipeline for Alt Finance. So HBCUs are an important part of the fabric of this country. Um, they have produced leaders in this country for the past 150 years. And I mean, the, and when you're talking about diversity and bringing talent about, defining a strategy specifically around HBCUs is critical to success. In fact, HBCUs, it's a federal designation under the Civil Rights Act, right? So this is about identifying students at schools that have historically produced leaders and bringing them into the economy. Um, one of the things that, that I experienced in Morehouse and you know my time there, it was something that I look upon as the finest years of my life, is that really you go to that school to be bred as a leader. That's the focus. If you wanna be a great warfighter, you go to the service academy. You wanna be a great physician, you go to John Hopkins. You wanna be a great tech leader, you go to uh, Stanford or you know wherever. But if you really wanna learn how to lead, mm. Morehouse was a great school for me. And so I look at that school um, and my time there as really development in leadership and not just leadership of people that look like me, but leadership of all people because it creates an opportunity for you. Did you feel like when you were getting your MBA and you were around a bunch of people who were basically in school to become leaders, you were a step ahead of them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, it was because of the experiences, the lived experiences that I had. Morehouse was part of that, but the human element, right? My background traditionally was, was engineering. I was an engineer and went to business school and fell into finance. And financial assets are what we covered for a long time. It's what you guys talk about in earnings. But the more complicated, and honestly, the more important asset is humans. Why do humans do what they do? How do they make decisions? How do they think about risk? And ultimately, everything else is a derivative of that. Being able to bring that experience to Duke, to the Fuqua School of Business, 
having some of that developed in Morehouse, having some of that developed by my parents. My father was a military officer. My mother was a school teacher. It's basically 18 years of a lesson in how to deal with people. I went to a Quaker school, how to deal with people peacefully, right? <laughs> it, um, it really creates a, a pathway for you to think about how to solve big problems like what we're doing at All Finance. So tell us then, if you're right now a student at an HBCU, how do you get involved with All Finance? Like, where is the connection, you know, at what level of your studies? And is this going to help you also get an internship before a job? Like, how does the process work? Yeah, so Alt Finance, number one, I would point everybody to our website, altfinance.com. That's Good A-L-T, plug. Yep. F-I-N-A-N-C-E <laughs> dot com. Um, there you can learn more about our program. So we have two programs that we run. Um, and really put our focus on today. One is our fellowship, which is a multi-year program focused on students at eight of our partner HBCUs, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Spelman College, Howard University, North Carolina A&T, FAMU, Hampton University, and Morgan State. So that was got eight, I counted. Eight, I got <laughs> yeah, it. You got them, yeah. Got them. Um, <laughs> so we have eight schools that we work with directly. Our program has quickly become one of the standout co-curricular programs at those schools. And so students apply to that. We just went through our, th- our fourth round right. uh, or, or our fourth cohort, and we have 57 incredible students from all eight of those schools that are joining our platform. But if you're at one of the other 100 or 94 HBCUs that exist, or there are 104, so 96, I'm sorry, HBCUs that exist, um, we have a platform called the Alt Finance Institute, uh. which we partnered with the Warden School of Business at University of Pennsylvania to develop a co-curricular digital platform that gives students access to both non-academic and academic content supporting their development um, in finance, investments, and alternative investments. Are you getting gender diversity? Because there's a a challenge on Wall Street when it comes to the balance of men and women. And I'm wondering if you see that in private equity as well, uh, outside of your program. So that does exist outside of our program. Uh, There are fantastic organizations like Girls Who Invest. Incredible shout out to the work that they're doing. We actually have a few Girls Who Invest uh, fellows also in our program. So there doesn't need to be competition amongst groups that are trying to increase the talent pool, right? Intersectionality, awesome. as we say. The intersectionality, yes. Molly, great word, thank you. That's um, the one. The intersectionality <laughs> is, is really where the recipe for success can be multiplied, right? Um, in terms of what Alt Finance is doing, and this is a byproduct of working with HBCUs where there is an over-representation of women and on HBCU campuses, Black women are one of the highest and fastest educated group of people in the United States. And so the fact that they show up on HBCU campuses is really a win-win. 45% of the women in our program, or 45% of the fellows in our program are women, Mm. which I would put that number up against any financial services firm. Um, I wouldn't think it's anywhere near 50-50. Right. And so by working with an organization like Old Finance, not only are you getting incredible diverse talent, but you're also making sure that you're getting well-trained women. Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, what are, I mean, what do you hear specifically from the women then as far as their feedback and coming into some of these workplace settings? Um, It's a challenge, right? I think that, you know, number one, uh, being a minority, but also being a gender minority or being a woman, not a gender minority in the grand scheme. But on Wall Street. In in that setting, for sure. Um, I think there, there, there is, are challenges and a lot of those challenges are culture driven, right? And the firms aren't a monolith. Some firms have really, really strong inclusive cultures. I like to think that our partners, Aries, Oak Street, and Apollo have incredibly inclusive cultures and have done very, very well and continue to do well in, in welcoming women into the workplace. But the industry in and of itself has had challenges. Why do you think that you've been so successful when it comes to the gender balance with the, with the fellows? compared to the recruiting at some of these firms? Um, We're very intentional about it. I mean, if something, if there is a pool and I see that we don't have what I believe is a representative number of women in the pool, we put more effort into recruiting really great women into our program, right? Then once you're in the program, we put a lot of effort into making sure that everybody has the shared time to grow and develop, right? That we don't let time, we try not to let people dominate time, right? We try not to let the natural um, inertia of a male dominated industry filter its way into our program, right? We, we believe that our program is a position of growth 
for men and for women, for sophomores, for juniors and seniors, and that in order for us to maximize the total output of what we're trying to do, we have to make sure that we allow maximum opportunity for everybody that's involved. Last 30 here for you, Marcus. So this marks year four of the initial 10-year commitment by those three founding firms. Um, what, do, what are we looking at for the next 10 years? They sign up for more? Look, <laughs> I think they appreciate what we're doing, but the reality is the burden of what we're doing should not fall on three firms. There are thousands of firms that are doing this across the globe. Um, we'd love to have global reach, but there are firms right here in New York City, right around this office that would benefit from a partnership with Alt Finance. And you'd accept that partnership? Right away. Very interesting. Are, are you getting incoming? We are getting incoming. Um, the proof is in the pudding, as yeah. one of our HBCU president said, and uh, I, I, I thought I might get that tattooed um, on me, <laughs> but, but he said, you've proven the concept, right? We've proven the thesis. We get a significant amount of inbound calls with people interested about how to you know, work with our fellows. But I think the reality is the return on investment is happening for the firms yeah. that made the commitment. It, we cannot do this for free. And so Probably. we want other firms to make a commitment as well. And I imagine next time you're with us, we might have uh, some more firms who have signed on. Marcus Shaw, President and CEO over at Alt Finance. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Dr. Anthony Fauci became a household name during the COVID pandemic. However, his journey to becoming the top infectious disease doctor in the United States started decades before, and really to his childhood back in Brooklyn, New York, and living with his family above his dad's pharmacy, the Fauci Pharmacy. He was a basketball player in high school, went on to become a doctor, and then spent 54 years at the National Institutes of Health, 38 of them as the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. During that time, he advised seven presidents on various diseases, including AIDS, Ebola, SARS, COVID-19, and more. Dr. Fauci writes about it all in his new memoir, On Call, A Doctor's Journey in Public Service. You kept a lot of notes, and I'm curious, we are curious, what it was like going through that, those notes, putting this book together, going back to you know your notes on the AIDS crisis or SARS or COVID for that matter, anything, any time in particular that made you stop, that really took you back in a big way. When you remember things in your mind 40 years down the pike and you go back over some of the notes that you made back in very stressful times, like those those terrible early years of HIV when I was spending most of my time taking care of desperately ill, mostly young, otherwise previously healthy gay men who were suffering terribly and then almost inevitably dying. Um, it really brings back, uh, you know, what I've described, and I mean that honestly, is almost a post-traumatic stress feeling of my goodness. I went through that and I had to suppress all of those feelings. And then when you start to write your memoir, in order to write it properly, you have to go back and re-examine those experiences and re-examine those feelings. So, you know, what I went through was a journey, but writing the, the memoir was itself a journey for me. You know, I want to stay on, on this topic here because I think it's fair to say there's a generation out there that really has no idea about the AIDS mm -hmm. health crisis. And we should remind people there have been more than 86 million HIV infections throughout the world, 40 million deaths. There's a part in your book where you write about a visit to the White House in 1996, nearly 30 years ago when then President Clinton asked you why there was no HIV vaccine. Why is an HIV vaccine still so elusive? Well, it's a very unusual virus in which the body, for reasons we still don't completely understand, does not make an adequate immune response to protect from or even clear the virus from the body. Most every other pathogen that we get infected with, mankind, civilization, even things that have a a, a fair degree of mortality like smallpox and and measles and then the crippling effect of polio at the end of the day most people clear those viruses from the body and the body's immune response serves as a model for how you should make a vaccine to protect a person who's uninfected from getting infected but we don't have that kind of a situation with hiv because once a person's 
infected, there are virtually no instances that are, are, are documented of someone who's actually spontaneously cleared the virus. There's a very small percentage of elite controllers who can control the virus, but there's no real evidence of anyone actually on their own, through their own immune system, clearing the virus. That's a very high bar for a vaccine to be able to do, because you want to do better than what even natural infection does. And that's the reason why, among all the difficult diseases, we just don't yet. I, I, I think we may get it because science will figure out a way to do it. But it's been very difficult because of the unique nature of HIV. I'm always amazed at, at doctors who are in very difficult situations and then but stay very level headed and 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 stay cool. And you have to, I would assume. Um, but I do think about your time with HIV and AIDS victims, ultimately, you know, because you write in your book, you think of the years from 82 until the late 1980s um, as the dark years of your medical career. I mean, you got to know a lot of these patients. Um, how I just can't even imagine how difficult it was. Well, it was terribly difficult. I mean, and it was even made more difficult by the contrast with what I had been doing in the prior nine years before we started seeing individuals with HIV, before it was even known to be HIV in 1981. My career had been quite successful, you know, parenthetically in developing therapies for inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. And we developed some protocols that had diseases that were formally fatal, have 90, 93, 95 percent remission rates. So we were on a real high, as it were, uh, uh, for accomplishments. And then all of a sudden you devote the rest of your medical career of taking individuals, taking care of individuals to a disease for the first several years, essentially all of our patients died with very, very few exceptions. And you're right, you do get to know them. You develop a, a really good patient uh, physician mm -hmm. relationship and you really care about them. I mean, you know, part of the the art of the art and science of medicine is to care for your patients and not only care for their medical issues but to care about them and that was very tough and it was several years because remember we started i did started taking care of persons with hiv in the fall of 1981 very soon after the first cases were recognized and then we did not get truly adequate therapy until mm -hmm. 1996 we got wow. the beginnings of some therapy which Mm -hmm. kind of slowed the disease down starting in 1987 with AZT, but it wasn't until the triple combination cocktail that showed that you could durably suppress virus to below detectable level, but that wasn't until 1996. So those were really difficult times. We're speaking with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's now a distinguished university professor at Georgetown. His new book, out now, it's called On Call, A Doctor's Journey in Public Service. Dr. Fauci, in the book, you, you write about how former President Donald Trump would ask, maybe after a, a, a tense moment or maybe an argument, are we okay? You know, and would message, you know, messaging would come back from his team or even Vice President um, Mike Pence's team too, that they, they love you, you know, again, after maybe some tense moments. You've served seven presidents um, during your tenure, um, starting with Ronald Reagan all the way to President Biden. Are all presidential relationships complicated or was just that one in particular? No, no, no. The, the, this was a very, and as I mentioned, mentioned explicitly in the memoir, this was a complicated relationship, a very unique relationship when you compare it with the relationship with other presidents, because we did in the beginning, I mean, e even though right now the people who are in the Trump camp, you know, are very hostile to me, I had a very good relationship with President Trump and we, we related well to each other. I describe it in the memoir. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was the rapport that two people, you know, who grew up in New York City, me in Brooklyn and him in Queens, had that kind of New York swagger relationship with each other. Uh, and it really was fine until I had to because of the fact that he was starting to say things that were just not correct from a public health and a scientific and, and, and medical standpoint. 
And I was put in a very difficult position, which I did not like, but I had to do it to preserve my own integrity as well as fulfill my responsibilities to the general public to have to contradict him in a public way when mm -hmm. I was asked publicly, is it going to go away like magic? And does hydroxychloroquine work, which it doesn't, yeah. and it can actually harm you. That's when the relationship started to fray. Yeah. Uh, and even when it did start to fray, I don't think that he wanted to have conflict with me, nor did I want to have conflict with him. Well, speaking of conflict, um, for better or for worse, you've become certainly a lightning rod um, in the dialogue about public health and in the dialogue about COVID. And, and I'm wondering if you have any regrets about your time at the, as the nation's top doctor in recommendations, in recommending school closures, anything like that in hindsight, given what we know now. Well, the first thing that it, we were dealing with a historic catastrophic pandemic that ultimately killed 1.2 million Americans and more than 7 million and probably closer to 20 million worldwide. At the time that we had to have that physical distancing and that slowing down, we used to call it flatten the curve, when the recommendations, and you know, most people, because I was the communicator of that, because I had been communicating with the public for four decades about outbreaks, that I was communicating with the public, there was the mis- interpretation, understandably, that I was making all the policy mm. about doing things like shutting down and having physical distancing. I think at the time when you make those decisions, you do it because you want to save lives. Were they perfect decisions? No. Would you like to have done a better job? Of course, none of us did it perfectly. But the idea about sh at least slowing down and closing things for a while was the right decision with masks, with shutting down, with schools. The issue right. that we need to re-examine, importantly, yeah. is how long you did that. And I think that's what we need to re-examine because if you look back, I was the one that said, we should open the schools as quickly and safely as we possibly could. Right. Because there is collateral damage when you keep school, schools closed for a long period of time. I am curious what you think the next big health crisis will be. The U.S. Surgeon General is warning about, you know, or wants to put a warning on social media, for example. You know, we're talking about flesh-eating bacteria in Japan. What do you think is the next big health crisis, and are we prepared for it? Well, you know, it, it, there are health crises that are infectious diseases, which is my lane. I right. still think that we have to be very careful to be prepared better and prepared to respond to the inevitability of another pandemic of an infectious diseases, because history has taught us that we've had pandemics since before recorded history. And we've had it in our own lifetime with COVID. Mm -hmm. And a hundred years ago, we had it with the 1918 pandemic of influenza. So my feeling is that the thing that would be most abrupt and surprising would be another pandemic, but you can't predict that because pandemics are not predictable, but there are a lot of other health crises, some of which you mentioned yourself. I mean, I think the epidemic of obesity in this country, yeah. I think the mental health crises, the, 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 mm -hmm. the issue with fentanyl and other narcotics that are killing so many people. Yeah. Those are the things that we need to address. Well, Dr. Fauci, appreciate getting some time with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Fauci, his new memoir, On Call, A Doctor's Journey in Public Service. Not new, it's his memoir. It is just out. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Tim, as you know, June is Pride Month, and all across the world, millions are donning their rainbow flag to celebrate the culture of the LGBTQ plus community. And though in the U.S. there's been plenty of progress in the pursuit of equality, justice, and inclusion, 
It's also been a complicated time for LGBTQ Americans as companies continue to walk a tightrope with pride out of fear of conservative backlash. Politically, there were 500 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced this year, with restrictions on gender-affirming care for transgender youth being the most common. For her take on Pride's progress and setbacks, is Sarah Kate Ellis, president and CEO of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, commonly known as GLAAD. It has been a roller coaster ride for the past 10 years. Before I started, we were headed into and really did have the winds at our back at that point on marriage equality. And then we saw a real sharp backlash to that. What we do at GLAD is we do an annual KPI or measurement tool that we have called Accelerating Acceptance. And it's a piece of research that measures culture and society to understand how accepting or not accepting it is for LGBTQ people in America. Once we passed marriage equality, we really saw a jump in acceptance in America. But then once we saw the 2016 election, we saw it dip down acceptance for LGBTQ Americans. And ever since we've seen it continually dip down as opposed to increase. However, what we haven't seen change and has stayed the same and is incredibly powerful for the past 10 years is that over 90% of Americans believe in equality and acceptance for the LGBTQ community. So we haven't seen that ever ever flow, but we have seen culture ebb and flow over the past 10 years. Sarah Kate, are, are you surprised that it hasn't been more linear? You know, honestly, after marriage equality, we really felt like wow, we're making so much progress. The wind is at our backs, like I said. So it was shocking, honestly. Um, But when you look at change in the trajectory and over long periods of time, it does ebb and flow. So I shouldn't have been surprised, but I really got caught up, honestly, in the power of progress that was happening at that time. And it, it was palpable in the culture acceptance for the LGBTQ community. And my my wife and I were able to get married. Mm-hmm. Our kids were at our wedding, you know, so it was like it was really it felt so good, like felt as though we were finally making headway. And we have made tremendous headway, but we have seen a backlash. All right. So we have made headway, as you said, 90 percent of Americans acceptance of the LGBTQ community. Why are then we seeing 500 anti LGBTQ bills introduced in 2024 if there's such a high acceptance level? I mean, I think about all the political polling. There's nothing it feels like that's 90 percent. And yet there's all this anti LGBTQ bills being introduced. Why is that? Well, you know, I think it's the continued disconnect between a handful of politicians and the American will and want, right? It's not a lot of politicians today don't actually stand up for the majority of Americans and where they see America going. So this is a handful of politicians who are vehemently anti-LGBTQ. And these bills have been sweeping across America. Now, the great news is, is that I think out of the 537 have passed, which Mm. is not a a lot, unless you live in that state, and Mm. then it's, you know, it's life changing for you. But the damage is done when they're proposed. And that's why we're seeing the backslide in acceptance, because these bills are defining who we are as an LGBTQ community because they're being talked about in the news media by anti-LGBTQ politicians. And they're especially targeting the transgender and gender non-conforming communities. And that's super dangerous because it's a small community within our community. They don't have a big voice. And that's why so many of us in the community are using whenever we get a chance to talk about it, are talking about the trans and gender nonconforming community because they've been politically used by anti LGBTQ political activists. Sarah Kay, one thing that's been really surprising to me, and we're Bloomberg, so we go, you know, companies is is the and, and economics and business is the lens that, that we look through so frequently, is what's happened with companies that they had fully accepted the idea of selling pride merchandise. I'm talking about Target, for example. It's it's now 
walking this tightrope because of fear they could face backlash like they did last year. So I, there are, you know, thank you for bringing this up because I think there's a lot of false narratives around this. Um, I want to say that th- that a couple of things. One is that what I've seen out of last year, yes, Bud Light and Target were targeted by a handful of anti-LGBTQ activists that did an outsized social media campaign. And it did cause some issues in the marketplace. And if you look at the latest gravity research, the majority of corporate executives and Fortune 500 leaders are not backing down from pride, from their pride strategy or what they are doing. And this is something that we've always asked for. And Target is doing this is actually making it pride 365 Mm. and not putting all their eggs in one pride basket, so Mm. to speak. Brands are really stepping up. They're not stepping down. And I'll tell you why. The reason is, is because CEOs and boards know that 30% of Gen Z are LGBTQ and 80% are allies. And they're not just allies for the sake of allies. They are very active allies. And so the future generation of employees and of consumers are highly attuned to the LGBTQ community. And in order to appeal to them, you have to stand up for the community. So we work with over 200 brands at GLAAD and none of them have been backing down. Um, So I think that there was a lot of headlines at that moment in time, but nobody really dug into the story. And when you look at the story, we haven't seen a movement from Fortune 500 companies. You have certainly played a role in media in terms of for the LGBTQ community and and being aware of it. Um, And I am curious how media has either helped or hurt in terms of acceptance and understanding by the broader public? We now refer to ourselves as a culture change because Hmm. um, media is everywhere, right? Um, And people have platforms that have never had platforms before. It's both a curse and a blessing. Um, We've seen media really accelerate acceptance for the LGBTQ community. You know, President Biden once said that Will and Grace did more for Mm -hmm. marriage equality than Mm -hmm. anything else. And I think- Do you you, you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of when you're thinking about folks who don't know LGBTQ people and opening hearts and minds coming into your personal living at that time it was like on tv so you didn't have phones coming into your personal living room or your personal space and make laughing with you and crying with you there's nothing that replaces that to move hearts and minds and to humanize people and it's quite frankly you know we're running three ad campaigns right now and because we understand that only 30 percent of americans know someone who's trans so the rest of the 70 percent of people in america are learning about transgender people Mm. through media we have this uh here we are now campaign we have protect this kid campaign we have all these media campaigns that we're running to introduce people in america to trans folks and humanize them. Yeah, and I do wonder how that impacts certainly the world more broadly, that if you have that experience, you're more accepting versus maybe if you don't, I don't know. Well, Sarah, Sarah Kate, that actually brings up a good point, and it's the idea that this is, we're not talking about a monolith here. And I'm, I'm wondering if what we're seeing right now in terms of what we were describing earlier with the path to progress not being linear, are we seeing more resistance to the trans part of mm. LGBTQ right now than the lesbian and gay part of it? I would say categorically, yes. And that's because 90% of Americans say they know someone who's lesbian or gay. And only 30%, as I said, more Americans report seeing a ghost than knowing a trans person. And so I do think that because people don't know trans people, that they are being targeted, and they're definitely being targeted by politicians. Most of those 500 anti-LGBTQ bills that you spoke of earlier Mm. are targeting the trans community. Mm -hmm. And for no good reason, trans people have always been here. They have gained more visibility than ever before, the trans community. And with that visibility comes fear because people don't know who they are. They're trying to understand. 
But once you know someone, it's really, once you know someone's story, once you meet somebody, it's really hard to hate them. How do you think about the investment universe, our world, that we talk about so much? Money money can bring attention to something, can move the needles on things. Um, the investing world can too. So I just, I'm curious how you think about that, if there's something to connect there or not. Well, you know, I think about our disposable income, right? As a, as a community is, I think, 1.1 trillion. And I think about companies understand, you know, a lot of times it used to be called the pink dollar. <laughs> I think companies understand that there is a lot of opportunity with the LGBTQ community on every level in investment, in consumer goods, in all of it. And so I think that helps our community along the way because from early on, it's been our community has been positioned mainly because the people at the forefront of our community that had their platforms were gay white men. And they could um, oftentimes hide who they were mm -hmm. in the workplace and rise into great positions that enabled them to have quite a bit of income. And that has been very helpful for our community in, in building our economic power and political power. What's the conversation you and I are having with Carol uh, five years from now? I think we're going to see a great acceptance. We're going to see 70% of Americans know someone who's trans versus 30%. And we're going to have a more accepting, kinder society. I know we have to get there. Um, and I know that we're in a little bit of a culture war now. But yeah. I think on the other side of it, we're all about moving forward, building, dreaming. And that is about tomorrow. You know, it's funny. I love that. I, I didn't hear people introduce themselves with pronouns until I went to my little brother's college graduation to show. And I'm, I, you know, I'm 40. Yeah. It wasn't done when we were in, when I no. was in college. Yeah. Like things have changed quickly. Yeah. There's been a lot that has actually happened, uh, I feel like, in the last couple of years. Um, you left a left us with some hope heading into the weekend. And I really, really appreciate that. I think our audience does too. Sarah Kate, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sarah Kate Ellis, she's president and chief executive officer of GLAAD joining us here in New York City. Um, yeah, I love that, right? Change does happen, right? And if you think about it, right, the pronouns was a great example of, right, we weren't talking about it. It wasn't, wasn't even on my radar, I should say. All right, everybody, you are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week, and this is Bloomberg. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.